Want to know how to fund 100 plus mortgages a year from an online community? Today, I'm joined by Kevin Kim. Kevin is an accountant who became a mortgage broker just four short years ago, and his mortgage business has taken off. He focused on this unique online community and leveraged it to build out lots of referrals. That's a fantastic conversation I have with Kevin. He's based out of Vancouver, BC. He's a 4th three black belt in Taekwondo and absolutely love this guy. So a couple things we're going to cover is how he used this online community to generate referrals, uh, how he's now set up a team to help him support and grow so he doesn't have to work so much. And then finally, I ask him, what would he do different if he were to start over today? What advice would he give himself? Even though he's had tremendous success, there's always learning that can happen. I absolutely love this conversation with Kevin. Before I jump into it, I want to give a shout out to our title sponsor, Finmo. Finmo is a Canadian mortgage application, document collection, submission platform designed specifically for Canadian borrowers. It's very easy for borrowers to use. It's got cool features like smart docs. As they're filling out the docs, it knows what the, sorry, filling out the app, it knows what docs they need. It's got smart submission notes, pulls key data from the app, and it's connected to the lender spotlight, which is the best tool for searching rates and guidelines. It's like the Wikipedia of lender rates and guidelines in Canada. Check them out at lendesk.com slash Finmo and ask them to give you a free demo. All right, let's jump into it. Hey, Kevin, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Scott. So excited to chat with you. Tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got in the mortgage biz. Well, I'm a mortgage broker for about, let's say four and a half, five years. I can't remember when was the exact date that I start, but the moment I started, I never looked back. Um, I used to be an accountant, um, but I was like always thirsty about being an accountant because I was like looking back so much, like looking back the databases, numbers, but um, I was thirsty to uh, jump into the business that is leading uh, with the, working with the clients um, and providing the solutions. So there's a yeah. client right there. You have so much, you can't even like this client's calling you in the middle of the podcast. I know, I know. I got like five different calls coming in and then I was like, okay, I can't do it now. Okay. So you basically accountant became mortgage broker four and a half years ago. Walk me through how it's gone for you. We're going to talk about your unique uh, marketing strategy that you've used to build a fantastic business. But tell me about how that, like, where, where does that, you know, can you, can you share your progression of like first year, second year stuff? I went. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I was very lucky for the very first year because that was the moment that everybody was like, oh no, like COVID is happening. And I was in the middle of transition from my full-time jobs to a full-time mortgage brokering. And I was studying and obviously I was taking classes and courses. And at the end, I was waiting for my exams to be happen, but it was mm-hmm. COVID lockdown. I had to wait for like four months. That was a perfect four months for me to prep all the marketing, sales, and training going on. So um, October 2020, I got my license and I had my license with the previous brokerages. And I started my broker journey with John Lee, um, who is still my mentor and being my partners for my company. But so far, uh, the first year was amazing because I had the live deals going on probably within like three weeks of the start, the launching day. Right. And probably ap- after like three three weeks, we've kind of realized like, oh, we cannot just focus on the products or the lenders and we have to change and we have to adjust to, to the live deal situation. So right. thankfully, I was able to learn from the, the deals, learn from the files and learn from the clients. And um, yeah, so first, first months, second months was quite busy with all the tasks that I had to accomplish. But the third months and the rest of the first year was busy with the files. So first year, I think uh, first year, I think I was funding 20 million and uh, most of the deals were five years variable. I think uh, listeners yeah. already knows like, Oh, this guy's spoiled. Five years yeah, variable so did I. Part. I mean, I put myself in a variable mortgage a few years ago, so I feel your pain. So first year was 20 million. What was the second year? Second years, uh, I was able to hit 28 million. So it was quite a another. And then what jump. about third year? Third year, um, that was the moment that I decided to kind of expand my business to a team size and team structure. So mm-hmm. I think I did twenty eight and thirty million ish, but with the two new teams. So right. it was you had more to do some. Re- it's like you had to rebuild to go to go faster or bigger. You needed to actually put some structure in place. Exactly. And then, so is this your fourth year now? Then, so are you talking? So what's this year looking like? This year, I'm looking at. Um, probably targeting 40 to 50 million 
Um, but my focus is more um, with uh, building more business with my new teams. So instead of doing me doing a lot more, but um, doing more with my teams. So 42 Okay. We're going to talk about that to your team structure. So how did you go from an accountant with, with obviously to doing 20 million in your first year? Where did, where did the bulk of your business come from? Like what was the, what did you do that actually seemed to, because that's quite a few files, right? How, how many files would that have been approximately? Yeah, there was about 100 files, uh, 100 funded files. And then, yeah. um, like I said, I think I was purely lucky because I was at the right time and right moment because um, because of the COVID, everything was um, leaning towards the work from home and online basis. So I was able yeah, to- Yeah, but lots of people work from home and not doing any work. So like, I mean, yes, I do think there's always an element of luck, but you do, you can make yourself more lucky, if you will, by do, being working hard. So- uh, the, where did the, the first hundred files that you got, where did they pr- mostly come from? Was it from your accounting network? Was it from, I know you have this online sort of community that you've cultivated. Where was it in the first year? Well, everybody believes that it's all from accounting backgrounds, but no. Uh, I intentionally not made a sales to my accounting clients because I didn't want to um, to make the impressions that I'm like getting new to an industry. I'm like making a sales call to a Maybe a past client who already built the relationship, right? With. Or a call. They're like, "Hey, I already. Th- you're an accountant. What are you? Why are you a mortgage broker now?" Like, exactly. So I can see. There's a little bit of yeah, yeah. So, and um, so I was more focusing on how I can make the present, but that was impossible in person. That was COVID lockdown. Nobody was meeting anybody, so I had to go in online. So Facebook, Instagram, videos. But I was able to come up with an ideas and join a uh, community um, in online chat rooms. So yeah. uh, basically that's more like um, designated and designed for Korean clientele. But um, there's a one service that is dominating probably 99% of chat users for Korean clientele, which allow um, business to kind of have a, a room. So is this like a WhatsApp, but for the Korean com- community, is that correct? Yeah, and a little bit advanced technology on it and a little bit more business focused. So, um, right. basically so what would, what would be the comparable version of some, is there something that's comparable that, that we would, that our listeners would know, or is no, it? No, it's really, it's really hard to tell because it's anonymous groups of people coming in for a one or two topics, like buying a home, investing, or first oh, So they're completely buyer. anonymous. So you don't know yeah. it's, it's, so you don't, it's not like you have their profile and you see they have cats and whatever. It's just, it's user number 26, 20, whatever. Yeah. I think it's more like, um, a WhatsApp groups plus uh red flags so a lot of people just put it on what they want to like reddit and stuff but yeah. it's live and it's anonymous okay and so then how do you take a this when what's it called it's called cop talk and okay and it also support a business users too so i sign up with the business users so i can kind of present i'm a professional i'm a legit person to talk to and talk about mortgages and at that moment, uh, a lot of realtors were creating those kind of small group. So I was participating and helping the realtors, which is also yeah. building the uh, referral business and relationship with them. But at the same time, I was finding my own clients, and right. which allowed me to refer those clients to my realtor partners, which really like makes me strong in the relationship. Because even though I was new, I was able to find my clients. And then well, you're exactly. adding it. You're adding like that's massive value. You're bringing them referrals from. So basically, you got this online. It's a business, fo- anonymous business focused chat groups that you would go in and answer questions. You're able to set up your own sort of little mini community within that. Yes. And so, in that first year, what percentage of your files do you think came from that? More than fifty percent. And where did the other fifty percent come from? Um, it was a referral from those fifty percent of clients. I closed with, and then they okay, but then, the then you did a good job. So it was, yeah. it's, so the clients actually referred you people on from that. So you use that community and then you did it, you service them. And then that turned into more business. Yeah. The biggest takeaway from that process was I didn't really realize like how referral uh, from the clientele is strong. Like, like that was the moment that I realized like, Oh wow. Like instead of like leaning towards or building the realtors, relationship which is like one direction Mm -hmm. or one transactional Uh, instead of doing that i should kind of be able to build up my clientele and then go from there um i I think a lot of listeners and uh, new brokers are having hard times to build up that first breakthrough 
But yeah. if you find out your first breakthrough, you have to focus on to how you can expand it from it instead of mm-hmm. having like multiple source of. Oh, results. and I just literally recorded a podcast that will, will have came out uh, Friday. So this is going to be one on Monday that I talk about four reasons to focus on a niche. Mm-hmm. And so this is essentially what you've done. You've got a niche sort of marketing strategy. And I mean, a, your client niche is, is going to be a lot of Korean first time buyers or investors. I think you told me those are the two main categories, but it's this sort of the Korean market that's underserved. And you speak both languages, right? Or you speak, how many languages do you speak? I speak Korean English. Okay. And so you basically, and then you took this 50% that liked you. And I just had a curiosity and this may, I don't want to like, do Korean people naturally refer or is it just that you've done a good job? Is that something that's, is it a cultural thing or is it just you've figured out that they, I don't know. I'm curious about that. Cause that seems like a good number of referrals for somebody, especially if you're brand new, right? No offense, mm-hmm. but you're brand new and you're getting these referrals. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, it's a cultural, uh, I think it's a cultural thing uh, for Korean people. If you buy a home, they throw mm-hmm. a big party for their friends and family and then invite everybody to their place. And um, they talk about, you know, who, who was the realtor, who was the mortgage broker, and sometimes even some details number about their mortgages and the rates. And back then I was able to deliver the service, but uh, beyond that, I was uh, trying to kind of give more value to the clients after the funding or like hosting the party, you know, providing mm-hmm. some food and, and beverages or even like gift cards to them. So, um, so if, think- if you, could you make like, cause, cause not all your clients were necessarily driving distance. So if you couldn't make them, did you go to, how many of them would you go to physically and how many of them would you just virtually, you know, send them stuff? Well, um, I haven't done any in-person meeting with clients for a long time from the get go. So it was all virtual call zoom or sending a gift to them. Um, I don't know. I think it's just me, but, um, I was just too. I was too nervous to kind of get connected. Well, and you got a person. young family, right? And stuff you got. So like, I get it. And you, and this was during COVID. So it'd been, even yeah. then they probably didn't do the big parties because it would be more challenging to do. Yeah. So, but basically one of the ways that you've leveraged this virtual community is when they come offline, they, you're connected to that event somehow, whether it's, yeah, and then they talk about you and then they send you more business and yeah. their, their friends talk to friends and turns in. And then that generates it's like this virtuous circle that, generated business that you could now go back to the realtors with and say, Hey, I got a referral for you. Exactly. Right. And then it was kind of building up, building up. And thankfully the market was hot and yeah. everybody feeling like precious to buy a home. But not only that, like being a mortgage brokers, I was able to tell probably my like logical thought based on my accounting background versus the mortgage brokering background. So the clients were like taking those two apples from me and then they're yeah. being like, Oh, he's pretty conservative. And I better listen to it. But at the same time, the market was driving uh, the basic fundamental of buying and selling. So um, right. it was a nice balance for me and for the clients too. Right. Okay. So then second year, 28, up to 40, be 40, 50 this year. And so is there anything that you've learned? And is it still today? So this, if you look at this last year, what percentage of the business was coming from that? online community that you cultivated and how much from yeah other it's sources? still decent i will say probably more than 40 percent even though the volume yeah. has went up i have still a good source of business and uh, i'm trying to leverage that source into a my own and my team's designated channels too and that service also allowed the business owners to kind of have a one-on-one connection with the actual user so mm-hmm. instead of having the anonymous a thousand people in one single room um, I could set it up a one on one or one on two, like a small group version. So the right. client is more attached to it and then they're feeling more, much more um, com- uh, comparable to talk about their mortgages in that channel. Right. Cause it's it. So you have this public room where people ask questions and talk and then you're able to kind of go into a, a breakout room, if you will, like in Zoom, except it's private and probably encrypted and everything. And you can work exactly. back and forth with that person. Yeah. And then is the goal from there to get them on a phone call or like a Zoom call or where, where do you, if, if, in the, you know, what's a typical trajectory look like? So our goal is to actually get the application. Um, getting even, before you call, call. even before you talk, like even before you actually physically talk to them. So you'll chat exactly. with them, DM them to get them to do an app and fill it. And will they fill out the whole app and documents or is what, where, how much is like enough for you to be like, okay, I'm going to move to the next stage. So uh, our target is to have a application documents and probably expect offer even before we talk about mortgages, but that's ideal. 
Uh, yeah. What we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to kind of establish our credits on online as much as possible so they can do all the due diligence even before they talk to us. So basically, hopefully they don't have any questions like, oh, who's Kevin Kim? Instead of doing that, uh, here's my Instagram, here's my Facebook, here's my YouTube. Check this out. And if you want to talk to me, this is the channel. So that's the ultimate goal of um, goal of our business model. And right now we're looking at probably 70% of clients are comfortable to share their application with us before they talk to or have right. a consultation with us. But, but, and then how active are you in these communities? Are you, how, like, what will be your frequency of, are you just answering questions or are you, is it like Instagram where you're posting content or you're dancing, you know, whatever? I know you've got guitars that you play. Like what's, what's, what's the thing that's engaging them beyond them wanting to talk about real estate? I think we passed the points that we have to be on like 24 seven and answering the questions because most of the questions in that community, it's already been uh, answered and people have been educated by our teams too. Like right. for example, like first home buyers, like they can do 5% down payment, 10% down payment. That's easy. So people in that room already ask and we already answer. So people ask and answer them by themselves. So we don't really have to touch anything. But if there's any topic that we want to get into it, people actually tag us. So we kind of like mm. get the notification and then we answer it back. And obviously we have to be really careful and then professional because it's actually talking to 1,000 people, 2,000 people mm-hmm. at once. And especially because of the mortgage, you know, confidential and financial, we always have to end our conversation as, okay, well, this is very general topics. If you want to talk you about won't, more, Yeah, you're not going to give specific, hey, based on your credit exactly. score 580, here's what I can do for you in, in front of a thousand people. That would be... Yeah, amazing. so we're not trying to do that, but it's more like if you want a uh, professional uh, advice, here's the link. But yeah, Getting click here. We'll talk off, basically go into this side room. So how large yes. are these groups that you're in? So I do participate in six different groups now. Um, yeah. The biggest group is 1,500 people for Vancouver home buyers. And there are most, most of them are uh, first time home buyers. And there's another group uh, with 700 people mainly focused on investing, like investing condo and, and small units. And there's another room for Calgary, Ontario, and um, uh, rest of the national Canada. So six rooms with facing about 3,500 people. Right. Okay. And so then I, I was just looking up this app called K- Kako Talks, K-A-K-O. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah. And it says it has an offline chat facility. What does that mean? Offline chat. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, it says, I Trump, it says, I, cause I said, is Kako better than WhatsApp? And it said Trump's WhatsApp because of its offline tra- chat facility. I'm like, mm-hmm. what? Okay. You don't even, you didn't need, you don't need it. So whatever it is, you're not, it doesn't matter to you. It's purely online chatting. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you basically built this a community. And so what I'm going to move on to your team in a second here, because I just find this fascinating. So basically you, you just to recap, you are an accountant, you said you can mortgage broker. And instead of doing the traditional model of I'm going to go out and find local people, you couldn't actually, you, you, you dive into these online communities. You start to build tons of trust and rapport, which generates referrals. You close mortgages, which generates more referrals and repeat and and just improve and repeat on that process and you know till now you're going to do 40 50 million a year mm-hmm. and uh is there anything else that um any other lessons you've learned over the last if you if you could go back to your first year doing this and say hey kevin do this what would you tell yourself like it's using this as a channel like as a, a marketing strategy they're doing i mean when i was focusing on this online uh, basis a lot of experienced mortgage brokers were kind of hesitant, hesitant to jump into this new market. And mm-hmm. I, I, I get it because it's tradition. It's not traditional ways to find um, trusty or uh, good loyalty. Yeah. Clients. People may be like, Oh, those people are just going to use you for information and then not work with you. Right. That would yeah, be which the is, fear that could. Yeah. That kind of makes sense. But as a new kind of newer brokers, like you, you need to break down and then you break through to it. And, um, that was just me doing a lot of massive online basis. And then that worked out. But if I go back and ask myself or like give an advice to myself is I would not burn too much time on that too. Cause that also, uh, gives me so much stress. And right. that was just causing me a lot of 
um, uh, which part was causing you the stress? Were you just feeling like you had to be on there answering all the time? So you felt like yeah. you were constantly on, on messaging and trying to get, give people answers. Is that what you mean? Exactly. I would, I would, or I should have like set it up some time limit for myself or even a system that I can kind of track it down how many times that I used or how many hours that I was spending time with. Cause that was like 24 seven and ongoing. Right. And, um, that really set it up a uh, wrong expectations to clients sometimes because well yeah oh, because they expect that now you, hey you responded last time at ten thirty why are you not now, now you're not responding and so now exactly. I'm annoyed right so it's like when my Amazon when I order something from Amazon and it's like it's going to be three days I'm like three days like I ordered something yesterday and it got here today it's yeah, so crazy exactly. I, I yeah and if it's like if it's a week you're like ah <laughs> it seems like a long time okay That's so right. uh, so tell me about how you've now in order to scale this out. Because we've we've talked about this, but how have you decided to put together some support or team around you so that you can serve more clients, but also not be twenty four seven on this online chat community? Walk me through that. Yeah, so because of those ongoing and probably unconditional lead generating from online, and I was having hard times to focus on those live deals, which actually need more time than um, finding more deals out there. So um, I was like, oh, I need the balance. I need the balance of finding lead. But at the same time, I need to spend good good time to uh, make sure my deals is going. Right. So very first step was finding a assistant and somebody who I can help, uh, who I can trust and get some help on my underwriting and do the fulfillment on the backside. And thankfully, I was able to find somebody who I can share time with. And um, so we don't have to kind of pay like eight hours or four hours. Um, I was able right. to find somebody. To that's a great, that's to. a great way to scale up support is to share somebody for people yeah. that are, you're kind of like, ah, do I need a full time? I don't know. Right. So that's smart. Yeah. And at the same time, you wanted to give out the, um, that some, some sort of like a security to the underwriters too. Like you want to make sure they're also happy. So I found a person uh, with my fellow broker and then it turns out to be she's actually busier than ever and both of the agents are really doing well so um, that was the first step to scale up and then and after i find out oh i'm pretty confident that we have a good process to uh, move forward we need more lead we need more um, agents to talk to the client so um, i was uh, i was starting to um, recruit two or three mortgage brokers who I can um, rely on to speak to one of my clients from the all those online and yeah, and it's been um, a year already and then yeah, it's going. So you've got a, so you've got your admin person and then you've got how many people that are also doing? Do they are they doing the full file end to end or what? Are they, or are they just kind of getting the lead ready to hand to you or what part are they doing? So we have three bro- brokers to talk to the clients and we are doing all the consultations, uh, filings, and and compliance and everything, but simply because they do have time and they want to see from A to Z. Um, yeah. Our ultimate goal is the brokers to focus on the sales and talk to the clients and move on. And we have yeah. two underwriters and fulfillment people, and and they are just focusing on those documents, dealing with the lenders and backing up the brokers. So you got some people that are focused, client focused, and then people that are lender focused on the back end or getting underwriting that get more work. Yeah. I wanted to make sure like we do have a good um, kind of like not just the teamwork, but the systems to work together because that's yeah. a lot of pieces to get together. And then if we miss one puzzle, then that can actually kill the deal. So um, I was focusing on more um, how we can share those notes or documents and without any like delay or head, uh, uh, confusion. So um, setting up those system itself was tougher than finding people. And Did you, uh, have you tried using it for, especially if you're doing Zoom calls, like recording the calls and using like a summary app that lets you use that? Because I have found that to be awesome for doing coaching calls or, and I've showed you this before, but I think it's a pretty great way. If I was doing discovery calls today, I would record them all and I would use something like firefly.ai to summarize the entire thing so that I have notes on it. Because I, I don't have the best memory. I, it's like, I swear to God, my memory is terrible. So mm-hmm. I love this digital have you done anything like that um in terms of like training 
we were uh, recording and kind of giving out the feedback, but for the, yeah. the first four, or like even, even talking to the uh, live clients from my broker side, I was trying to kind of use some of the AIs. And I think that's probably one of the best way that we can implicate as of today is instead of being afraid about, oh, AI will take over our job. But instead of doing that, why don't we just utilize it first and be the leader of user? So um, I will take that note and probably implicate to my uh, my brokers too, but hopefully they're happy with that. Yeah, well, I like we started doing this with our, you know, some of our team, we record these calls, discovery calls and stuff. And it's amazing just, and they're, they're good at their job already, but it's like watching game tape. If you're a football player or a golfer and you never see a video of your swing, how do you really know? You mm. think you're doing it a certain way. When you go back and look at it, you're, you think, oh my goodness, that's actually, I'm a little off there. And so mm. there's a lot of value in any professional who watches their game tape to try and improve. And I think if we're sales professionals, then having a, 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 a system to do that would be helpful. And you're, you're kind of scaling with this team. So I love what you're doing with the team. And so basically that you've got some folks that are doing the, the, this interaction to try to get the lead in and then your team helps get them funded. And so what, with the current people you have, you don't add anybody new. What do you think is realistically the capacity of files that you guys could manage without you, know, you having to work 24 seven again? So basically I'm targeting about 20 to 30 live deals within our teams per month. Right. And, um, it's simply because those those brokers that I've been hiring, they are part timers. They're not full time brokers yet. Right. And then um, uh, there was a logic behind, but uh, long story short, um, I know how hard it is to um, transfer entire your business into a mortgage broker, which is hundred percent commission basis. Yeah. So um, that's a realistic target for them. It's probably like one to five deals per month. So kind of they have for each sense of them. So of if you what, do, let's say, if you do ten or fifteen, then you got three people doing five. That's thirty files, exactly. and, you, and they're not working full time. Yeah. And, and and you win because you can service more clients. They win because they get to, to learn and get uh, experience and also earn money, right? And, yeah. and they don't have yep. to quit their day job. So it's a good exactly. it's good for everybody. And you have support so, in the back end to help make sure that the files actually get across the finish line in terms of like, yeah. the fulfillment and stuff. Yeah, so far my brokers closed nine deals and eight deals. So that's yeah. all total like 17 deals out of two brokers and one is in training. So um, let's see how it goes. I got one other question. So when you said in maybe, I'm gonna, two questions. In the year that you did the 100 files in the first year, how many leads did you, did it take you to close 100 files? So think? I was, yeah, I was like listening to your uh, episode and then, you know, uh, I was quite curious about the number games, how mortgage industry works. So my back data number is in order to- Well, you're, close, you're an accountant. So I know that if you don't have, you, you're, you're gonna have probably, you know, you probably like numbers or you wouldn't have been an accountant. Yeah, yeah. and I'm sure there's a lot of better brokers who has a better number and a ratio than us. But to close 100 files, I needed about 170 to 150 uh, accepted offer and live deals. And in, right. in order to get that, I needed about 300 pre-approvals. So which that's means a, that, that sounds about pretty. That actually sounds pretty good. Has that really? number improved since year one, or has it is it changed at all? I'm so year one and year two has been improved. But year three, or it's kind of like a slowing back to because the, the, I think the market's getting harder. So it's yeah. it's actually it's not that. So you're gonna need I, what I've discovered talking to experienced brokers and is that they're they're needing more leads to close the same number of files just because of so there's more leakage in your yeah. business, right? I agree with you. And then uh, there's more comp uh, competition. Uh, in terms of the lender and the product itself, but I don't want to talk about the raid and how we're losing files yeah. to branches, but that's happening. But at the same time, because of the, the system and then the amount of the lead itself that we want to deal with, it's a lot more. So there's a higher chance that we're not going to have the loyalty client. So I think it's natural, but my number back to the year one and year two, it's getting better, but, um, I agree with you. Like we need more lead to close files now. Yeah, 300 to get 150 to close 100 is actually not bad. Usually it's like, especially in your first year, I would say the average person their first year, they, they it's harder for them just because they don't, they've never done many discovery calls. They don't know how to, even if the client's kind of in, but it seems to me like, well, A, you're smart. Obviously you wouldn't 
uh, being the accountant background and stuff, but you're smart, but also the the amount of trust that you're building before they even talk to you is probably also a factor, right? Like you're, exactly. they kind of feel like I already know this guy. I've been messaging him and like there's been lots of back and forth. And so no different than this podcast. I've met some amazing people and they say, oh, I feel like I know you, Scott. And I'm like, cool. And I've listened to podcasts where I, I, I feel like I know them. I saw one guy once at a conference and he didn't know me and I was going to run up to him and be like, hey, and I'm like, wait a second, he doesn't know who I am. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I feel like I know him because I've listened to so much of his content, but I know that he wouldn't know me. So I'd have to be, so it's just no different than in this. You're creating with through your conversations because a lot of them are public. You're actually creating a lot of trust. That is right. So I think that's a part of the strategies that we really have to focus on building our brand instead yeah. of we're being mortgage broker and providing the lowest rate or so. I mean, I, that's not the key of this business. And I think I was very lucky for the first years that I didn't really have to build or I didn't have time to build that brand, but I was one and only who's doing it. So I was the, yeah. probably the one where the very early stage or early person to jump into the market. So I don't have any comparison out of like 20 years. But ago. now you can leverage that community into a, that building your brand even outside of that community, which is a great idea, right? Yeah. You do want to yeah. build your personal brand does matter. Actually, I've been, I've been thinking more and more about that. And just it, the, if you have a good, you know, uh, Warren Buffett always says it takes 20 years to build a reputation in five minutes to ruin it. Like if Warren Buffett said, Hey, I need, you, you know, you have, let's say you had $5 million in your bank and he said, I need your 5 million bucks. I need to, you'd probably like take it. You have mm-hmm. such a high level of trust that you, w- you wouldn't even think twice about somebody like him. And so our brand, our reputation is super important and you're building this with all these folks. And so if there's a way to leverage it, even outside of that sort of area where you're in, whether that's mm-hmm. just on your own personal website or something, like definitely that's something that we can chat about at a future time. I think that there's there's a lot of opportunity there for you to expand it beyond. That's like, what's it think of like a fishing hole? You got this great fishing hole and it's like, well, what else can I do now that I got this kind of dialed in is there another can i expand outside of that into other markets because maybe it slows down over time or maybe it who knows but you've you've used it to leverage into other things right yeah and then if i look back for the first and the second year i think i had a very high expectation about um, the work ethic and the amount of work that we have to put it in to get a mortgage simply because i didn't really know what is going Mm -hmm. on behind the scene so um I think I was one of the noisy brokers that always asking questions and always try to oh, try. Oh, that's to... not bad. Yeah. Okay. You got to tell me, okay, one. there's two things I want you to talk about because we talked about this. One, you said that one time you'd asked a question out of mortgage broking and Ron Butler answered, but he actually was punking oh, you. Man. So tell me about that because that is hilarious. <laughs> I know. I mean, I love Ron and um, yeah. I respect him so much. But um, so I was like asking some questions regards about how I can win deals over the branch. And I think it was yeah. about rate and the terms and products. And a lot of like experienced brokers already made a amazing answers. So Ron didn't have to go through all the negativity things. Okay. So he, I think he was just having some fun. He's having fun with he, he loves to do this. This is when you're yeah. brand new too. So yeah. Yeah. So he was just commenting about, Hey, Kevin, like if you ask nicely to the branch or the lender, then they might ask or they might accept it. I was like, okay, how can I ask nicely? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, just follow this. So he kind of shared some magical, like funny jokes. Some and, pixie dust. Hey, do this and you'll get, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I was like, okay, I got to do it. Like I'll do it. Like I, I just, love how coachable you are, man. You're just like, okay, I'll try it. Even if it, he was totally messing with you. I know. Like I didn't feel like, oh, like this is weird because I was new, but at the same time, I really wanted to make it happen. And then, oh, if this is the way that Ron is doing deals, I'll do it. Why yeah. not? Right. And it was just simple. Ask nicely. So I asked the lender nicely, but obviously the answer is, well, <laughs> I nope. still don't know. It's like, Hey, can you give me an exception and lower the rate by half a percent? They're like, no, but I'm going to ask really nice. Ron said it works. <laughs> So, That's yeah, so funny. I replied to him. He was like laughing so hard. And then obviously I kind of realized like, oh, he's just messing up with me. He's punking but, you as they, I don't know yeah. what the kids say now, how they call it. But, uh. <laughs> but okay. I and talk that, to me about yeah. Taekwondo because you're also, you're a fourth degree black belt in Taekwondo as well. So I, I know it's nothing to do with mortgages, but I always find it fascinating. Anybody who spends that much time to learn something. So tell me about what was your biggest lesson from the years of Taekwondo that you've applied to your life and business? Oh man. So I've been training Taekwondo ever since I was, I remember probably like age of five or something. So that was 
probably 100% of my life. Mm-hmm. And I was pretty uh, competitive. So I was in the tournament and winning games, losing games. That was just my life. And one of the biggest discipline that I got was if you put your efforts and the time and then trust the process, the results should come and follow. Right. Um, but unfortunately, I lost my final match and I was like, okay, well, I just found the wall. Like there's, there's that a was lot your, of you thought people. that was your limit. So you've got to, and what was this a very competitive tournament or something you're at? This yeah, one you lost? it was a national wide comp- competition and I never lost in my life, but I actually lost at the very first competition, uh, match to, to move into the Olympic levels. And I kind of find out, Oh wow, there's a lot more people who is better than us or better than me. So, um, yeah. that was a moment that I was like, okay, I'm just going to quit. This is my limit. I'm just going to move on. But, and go into the accounting world and then eventually into mortgages. Well, but to be fair me, though, the guy that beat you also went on to get bronze in the, uh, Olympic. So it's not yeah. like you lost to a slouch who was, didn't know what they were doing. You lost to somebody who was, but for you, you said getting bronze in the, in Taekwondo at the Olympics is almost like it's, it's national shame because it's like we expect gold, right? Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. It actually feels better, but, <laughs> uh, that was the biggest outcome from our, our team, probably more than like a hundred, hundred players out there. But like you said, like if you get a like bronze medal in, and South Koreans expectation that that's not good enough. Right. Their name will not be shine, but it's, it's the reality. I lost them. And then, um, that was the moment I realized like, Oh, I better like do something else. This is not mine. So, um, that was the moment that I realized like, Oh, like I have to find something else, but uh, it was kind of tough. So, um, I moved to Canada and then I graduated my high school and university and I find out counting is easy job to get in, but hard to get out. And right. uh, a lot was, of jobs are like that. Yeah. It was more for money and the work itself. And obviously I was trying to find happiness from doing it, but uh, I always felt like, Oh, like this is not my thing for forever. But right. I had the moment that I can, I can change. So I'm very thankful for that. Right. That's awesome. Okay. Last question. And so you joined Bricks recently. So what was your, what, what just did a curiosity, what made you decide to come and join us? And we're grateful to have you by the way, but I'm curious. Yeah. So, um, from the beginning of my broker journey, I did not know much about, um, options out there. And thankfully I've been connected with a great mortgage, uh, industry partners, brokers, and uh, my previous mortgage uh, brokerages that I got so much support from it. And I think I've been spoiled with so much spoiled. I'm a, I was spoiled with so much support because right. I was so obvious, but I was reading through so many horrifying stories about, oh, my brokerages did this, my team did this. I was like, really? Like, is it true? Like, how come? But until we realize uh, we need to find more um, support for my team and my, my, my new structure of building teams, mm-hmm. I was curious about what's out there. Like, is that the best option for me and my team and, you know, my future plans too? And then I realized there is a better way to leverage my team structure and which mm-hmm. can protect my future interest on all the, all the agents that will perform better and then being better so that's was the that was the initial thoughts about me. right well hey man we're great as i say we're grateful to have you so where can people find you online if they're looking for you so um everybody can google kevin kim mortgage i'm in instagram kevin kim mortgage as well too and then now i'm starting my talk show and youtube channel it's not launched yet but um, it will be also running as a kevin kim mortgage talk with Kevin. I can't, I can't so, wait to see that too. So that's going to be, uh, it's going to be awesome. So Kevin, yeah. man, awesome chat with you. Thanks for sharing, being an open book and being willing to share your successes. It's, it's pretty admirable to see what you did in such a short period of time. And you're so humble. Like I've met people that act, that have done less mortgages, but act like they're. And so we, that humble attitude of yours, you're going to just continue to grow because it means you're always looking for, you're not, you're not done learning. As soon as you think you have it all figured out, you're done learning and that's it. But you're just like, I mean, you even took Ron Butler's advice on how to get 
lower rates from your lender, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. And Scott, yeah. I've been always following you and your content, your teams. And I'm so uh, thankful that I'm being part of VRX family. Uh, but one small um, thoughts on this is I know a lot of new brokers are listening to your contents and uh, following all the uh, advices that you're giving out. And that really works. And thank you so much for doing it. And um, no matter how or where the agents are, I think you are, uh, you're, you're, you're putting, you're, you're putting a lot to those new ones. So thank you. So right. Much. Yeah. Whatever they decide, it's all good, but you know, we want to make sure that we, whatever we produce, we try to make it as useful as we can. So yeah. thanks brother. Good chat with you. Thank you. Hey, thanks again for listening. And hopefully you're inspired by my conversation with Kevin. You know, a couple of things I took away from it. One, he, was it not he was not, he was willing to take the risk and try something different so this whole community that he got involved in a lot of established brokers that were out there just ignored it he didn't he jumped into it he leveraged it and he has now since built on it and he's expanded that with a team i i love his approach and the other thing with kevin that it you know even the story we talk about with ron he's a very coachable guy so one of the reasons i think that he has been so successful is that he will when he hears a good idea he'll take it and apply it and unfortunately too often i see that people will see these great ideas and never do them and then they don't get the benefit. So uh, hat tip to you, Kevin. Thanks again for listening. And as I always say, if there's no problem in your mortgage business, someone else hasn't already solved, your problem is who's got the answer. Hopefully this gives you some answers. Thanks again for listening. I'm Scott Peckford, and I will see you on the next show.